So first, I want to say thank you to Jacob for having me here. Uh, it's uh, exciting to, to see, excited to see what everyone has to think um, here. So um, today, I want to talk about how we understand the relationship between axioms and interpretations. And so we have, uh, just in a crude sense, we have um, Today, we have a, an understanding, something like the following. Uh, philosophers in particular have an understanding that looks something like the following. You have a set of axioms, and uh, based on those axioms, a number of interpretations are possible. And the central question then is, which of those interpretations is the correct one, the true one? And so in quantum theory, uh, this looks something like the following, where you have a uh, among a set of axiom candidates, you select uh, uh, presumably a, a proper subset of those. And from that, you um, derive a certain interpretation of those axioms. Um, and so, for instance, you may have uh, one set that gives rise naturally to the Copenhagen interpretation, one that gives rise to something like GRW, one that gives rise to something like Bohmian mechanics. And this fairly naturally leads to um, results that we call no-go results. And so the idea is uh, you assume just those things that are true of um, any would-be quantum theory, and you demonstrate that some or other interpretation is just not possible. So I've uh, thrown up a diagram here to roughly represent the situation. So among those axiom candidates, you select just those that you think are factual or uh, must be true of any would-be quantum theory. You demonstrate there's a certain viable subset of interpretations. Usually you're ruling out one or other interpretation. And so we can understand Bell's theorem is doing something like this, where uh, among the viable interpretations, uh, you have contextual hidden variables and you've ruled out non-contextual hidden variable interpretations. Uh, again, this is uh, fairly crude, um, but I think it uh, roughly represents the, the situation. And so it's on this kind of an understanding that we look at uh, von Neumann's proof. So we think of it as a, a no-go result, um, uh, roughly similar. So the idea is he uh, supposedly was uh, delineating just those uh, essential facts of any would-be quantum theory, and he proves his theorem and demonstrates that hidden variable interpretations fall outside of that subset. But of course, uh, one of his assumptions we now recognize is not essential, namely the linearity of expectation values. So uh, in particular, we tend to look at uh, some things that von Neumann says, as well as uh, things that others say, um, uh, like this is actually the quote that Adam threw up earlier. So, uh, this is from his uh, 1932 book where von Neumann understands his, um, his results as saying, um, it's therefore not, as is often assumed, a question of reinterpretation of quantum mechanics. The present system of quantum mechanics would have to be objectively false in order that another description of the elementary processes than the statistical one be possible. Of course, the reaction from Bell in particular, but others as well, is von Neumann's proof was not merely false, but foolish in particular because he assumes um, linearity. Central claim of my talk is going to be uh, the following. Um, essentially, that I, I think this is wrong, the wrong way to look at what von Neumann was up to. So I'm going to claim that von Neumann correctly used Hilbert's axiomatic method to definitively prove the logical impossibility of hidden variables in quantum mechanics. I'm going to call this his axiomatic completion of quantum mechanics. And I'm going to contrast it with uh, the explanation that came before, uh, which I'm going to call axiomatic reconsideration. Now, on its face, this is going to sound fairly ridiculous, right? I'm saying that uh, von Neumann proved that uh, hidden variables are logically uh, impossible for quantum mechanics. And this is just going to ring as false, given, in particular, Bohm's theory. The trick here is that quantum mechanics does not mean what we kind of think of it as today, where it's roughly something like any theory of quantum phenomena. I'm going to say that quantum mechanics means something fairly specific uh, in this historical context. So 
uh, just to say that again, what I'm going to be providing is a different way of framing von Neumann's proof. So we have the standard way of understanding it as an axiomatic reconsideration on the right, in particular as a no-go result. And what I'm going to say is it's an axiomatic completion, and I'm going to flesh out what falls under that black box on the left throughout the talk. Just outline what I'm going to say. Uh, the talk has three parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about Hilbert's axiomatic method. I'm going to say it actually works from a given interpretation to a unique formalism. And then with this formalism, you can answer a variety of questions that you may have about independence or consistency or uniqueness. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about a uniqueness question or what could be understood as a uniqueness question that quantum mechanists of the time, Schrodinger in particular, we're asking, namely, could quantum mechanics be extended with hidden variables? In the third part of the talk, I'm, I'm going to talk about von Neumann's work uh, specifically. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about his two 1927 papers, and I'm going to say that these successfully answered the question in the negative. I'm then going to argue that his 1932 textbook merely made the results that were obvious from his 1927 papers made those explicit for his audience. Audience of the 1932 book, that is. Okay, moving to the first part of my talk. Uh, like I said, I'm gonna talk about Hilbert's axiomatic method. And uh, in this section, I'm going to uh, talk about what the axiomatic method was for, who it was for, uh, what's required of it for it to serve that purpose, and just note a few important features uh, for, for uh, my purposes here. So first question, what is axiomatization for, understood as Hilbert's axiomatic method? Well, the method was not used solely by Hilbert, um, and it was actually uh, relatively uh, well understood among at least a certain subset of uh, physicists at the time. So here I have Einstein delineating what the axiomatic method for it, what the axiomatic method is for, uh, namely separating between the factual and the formal content of a theory. So here we have Einstein saying, so far as the propositions of mathematics correspond to reality, they are not certain. And so far as they are certain, they do not correspond to reality. Complete clarity on the situation came, he says, from Hilbert's axiomatic method. And the progress that the axiomatic method achieved was to cleanly separate between the logical formal content, uh, the logical formal uh, from the factual or intuitive content. And he says, the, only the logical formal is the subject of mathematics according to the axiomatic method, but not the intuitive or other content connected to the logical formal. And so we already see here a hint that the axiomatic method is meant for a fairly specific purpose. Um, and we, we get a hint here that it's actually for mathematicians in particular for understanding the mathematical structure of a theory. And uh, we then see uh, from Hilbert that, yeah, this is, this is correct. And so Hilbert says that it's primarily for orienting and ordering the um, future mathematical research in particular. So we have Hilbert in his axiomatic thinking, 1917, saying that the fundamental propositions of an area of knowledge can be seen from an initial standpoint as the axioms of that field, individual field of knowledge. The continuing development of that field of knowledge is then founded merely on the further logical development of the already presented framework of concepts. This standpoint is prevailing, especially in pure mathematics. And he goes on to say that it's actually the axiomatic method that is responsible for all of the major mathematical breakthroughs of the previous century, including, of course, geometry, his work on geometry, but also analysis, set theory, and a number of other uh, important developments. Okay, just to give a crude example um, to kind of uh, get uh, our, our heads around um, what's going on here, uh, I print, present an example where uh, say we're interested in driving from point A to point B, which I've represented on this very crude map here, um, which I'll call map one. And as we can see, uh, I've drawn up uh, a path here. And so in fact, we can draw what I'll call a computational path from point A to point B. Uh, 
But note a couple important features of this map here, um, which as you may be guessing, I just very poorly copied and pasted from Google Maps. Um, but I also made some uh, scale changes, some uh, rotations here. Um, but despite all of that, I can still map out a path from point A to point B um, that would allow me from drive, excuse me, to drive from point A to point B. But we might have another map at hand, um, namely the one uh, on the slide here, which I'll call map two. And again, we can see that uh, we can throw up a computational path from point A to point B that would give rise to driving directions that would get us there. So turns out that uh, turn by turn directions that we might derive from either of these maps are trivial. Um, it just involves following Mount Baldy Road. So it's a, a, a mountain just north of um, the LA area. So it turns out uh, turn by turn directions generated from either of these maps are fairly trivial. That is each computational path that I've marked out gives rise to the same directions. And it actually turns out that um, regardless of what we pick as point A and point B, we can get the same turn by turn directions. That is computational paths that we map out on either of map one or map two will give rise to the same turn by turn directions. Of course, we're making some uh, interpretive assumptions of how to understand each of these maps or the contents of each of these maps. Um, they're just, they're distinct as we kind of look at them. We, we can tell that they're encoding different information. Nevertheless, we'll say that they are formally equivalent relative to the interpretational assumption that all we care about is generating turn by turn directions. Um, to tell us how to drive from any point A to point B. And so this is supposed to roughly represent what's going on uh, or what a mathematician might care about here. So they'll want to work with only what they need uh, relative to the assumptions about what matters in a particular uh, kind of computational framework. And so they'll opt for the turn by turn directions over either of the computational paths that I've mapped out here. And what I'm going to say is, this is just to say that they want the unique formalism representing turn by turn directions or representing the information that we care about. And so this is what we have uh, Hilbert actually saying here um, in the uh, joint work between Hilbert, Nordheim and von Neumann in 1927, where they provide a characterization of quantum mechanics as it was understood at the time. So we hear him saying of how an ideal uh, mathematical theory would be developed. First, a number of physical demands are placed on that theory. One then develops or selects an analytic apparatus that meets those demands. Then you consider interpretations of that analytic apparatus. And you might think at this point, aha, I know how this works. Um, you just do all of your model theoretic uh, reasoning business and you come up with an interpretation. But as you continue reading, it's clear that that's not how Hilbert is thinking uh, of the situation. So he says, the aim in doing so, that is considering interpretations, is to so fully formulate the physical demands that the analytic apparatus is uniquely defined. This way is thus that of an axiomatization as he carried out with geometry. Uh, and he goes on to say, this is just what I did with geometry where the important relations were point, line, and plane. And I showed that uh, these um, elements are, and their relations are exactly satisfied by linear equations. So he relates his understanding of how uh, um, ideally quantum mechanics would be developed. Uh, he's relating that to his previous work on geometry. So now that you've specified an analytic apparatus, you might ask a variety of questions. Um, in particular, you might ask, uh, can a uh, formalism be extended? And here with the, the map examples that I've used, you might ask, could we extend uh, our uh, turn by turn directions with topographical information to provide better directions? So that map two contains some uh, topographical information. Uh, can we use that? And the answer is quite trivial here, but 
Um, the answer is no. Uh, if you're assuming that uh, the two maps are equivalent, you can't add that extra information without breaking the equivalence. It's trivial. Uh, but in uh, certain cases, um, in more you know, um, complicated cases, uh, it, there may be a legitimate question of whether the formalism I've, I've specified um, is capable of a um, variety of extensions. I now want to note two important features of the axiomatic method as I've laid out here. So the first is that it's relative to an interpretation. And so I'm going to say in anachronistic terms that uh, an axiomatization is a lossy representation of an area of knowledge. It's not meant to represent everything that we, we think we know about an area of knowledge, just what we think is um, especially important. And that's wrapped up with how you develop the, um, what you consider the physical demands and uh, what you consider the important concepts. And the important point is that the axiomatic method is, or the axiomatization itself, is meant to orient and order our knowledge so that it can be further developed, particularly mathematically. And so with the map example, we might think that uh, developing this, um, what I've called formalism of turn by turn directions could be helpful for uh, avoiding confusion with nearby styles of directions, say using landmarks for distance, where we, we tend to float between the two when we're giving folks directions, but uh, they are in fact distinct ways of giving directions. So it's relative, but also an axiomatization is provisional on this understanding. So in particular, the axioms that we, or what we select as axioms today, we might tomorrow instead think that, well, those should instead be considered theorems, or in fact, um, depending on how things develop, we may think they, they aren't even true. Um, so we got to toss them out uh, and make some more parsimonious choice. And so because the factual formal distinction rides on what we consider our axioms, the uh, notions of formal and factual are also provisional. That is, if um, we decide to uh, deepen the foundation, say, to extend it to include new information or perhaps revise some of uh, our understandings of the area of knowledge, uh, we may just change the axioms, thus changing what counts as formal. So using the map example, um, we may, if we're interested in biking from point A to point B, we may now want to include the topographical information. And if that's the case, map one and map two, uh, so understood, no longer encode the same information. And so we've broken the equivalence. So just to summarize this first part here, I'm saying that Hilbert's axiomatic method separates between the formal and factual aspects of a theory of a domain as understood today. The mathematician cares in particular about the formal aspect. They care about the, the mathematical part. And um, obviously tomorrow is not today. So this is uh, an axiomatization of our understanding today. And what we do tomorrow, hey, I don't know. We may change things up pretty drastically. Moving to the second part of my talk, I now want to talk about, just lay out some of the, the basics of um, the situation in quantum mechanics at the time, or quantum theory, quantum theorizing at the time. So I'm going to say, just a reminder, that quantum mechanics had uh, what could be considered a uniqueness question uh, from the point of view of the axiomatic method. And I'm going to say, in particular, Schrodinger was asking this question, this question namely, could quantum mechanics be extended with hidden variables? I'm first going to say that there were two, what I'm calling computational paths on offer, uh, matrix and wave mechanics. And I'm calling them computational paths because I just wanna emphasize that they are not complete formalisms at that point. I'm then going to talk about their uh, putative equivalence. I'm going to talk about the uh, coalescence of an interpretation around the same time, uh, namely the statistical interpretation. And then I'm going to come back to the question of hidden variables, which was an open question the time. So to give a brief rundown of the history, first on the scene was matrix, or as it was called then, quantum mechanics. Uh, it was developed in 1925 over a series of papers, um, especially by Heisenberg, Born, and Jordan. And its primary concern was the outcomes 
of experiments. And so the noteworthy features for my talk here, what's important here are that it uh, concerned discrete energy states and it had uh, quantum jumps. Um, those were an essential feature of understanding the formalism, understanding that, that uh, quote unquote computational path. Shortly thereafter, Schrodinger developed his wave mechanics in 1926, fleshed it out over a series of papers in 1926. And as we all probably know, this concerned waves propagating in Euclidean space. And so as a, a contrast to matrix mechanics, quantum mechanics, uh, it appeared to be continuous in an important respect. So at the um, Practical quantum problems of the time gave rise to these two distinct ways, uh, these two distinct computational paths. Shortly thereafter, though, we had some demonstrations of equivalence, and it was around that time that we start to see each of them referred to as uh, quantum mechanics, kind of that loose collective of matrix and wave mechanics as quantum mechanics. And so first on the scene were some uh, demonstrations that matrix and um, uh, wave mechanics give rise to the same predictions. Uh, and th this was shown with a variety of fairly simple um, simple cases, simple problems. Uh, and this happened uh, through early and mid 1926. But then you had the development of a number of uh, operator uh, formalisms to represent the two, um, the two distinct uh, computational paths of matrix and wave mechanics. And these developed in late 1926 to early 1927. Uh, perhaps the most famous is Dirac's, um, what came to be called transformation theory. And of course, you also had Schrodinger's um, so-called uh, equivalence proof of matrix and wave mechanics. And so it was generally understood at the time that wave mechanics um, and matrix mechanics after these uh, various equivalence results, uh, it was understood that they were equivalent. But of course, around the same time, you had uh, an interpretation coalesce for understanding how to relate this now kind of loose collection of formalisms that were understood to be equivalent, how to understand what those were saying about uh, various uh, like particular quantum problems. And that was the statistical interpretation. And it was simply assumed, which we can see here in von Neumann's second 1927 paper, which I'll talk about in a little more detail um, in the next section, he was dissatisfied with this situation. So he characterized uh, the predicament as follows. The method commonly used in statistical quantum mechanics was essentially deductive. The absolute square of certain expansion coefficients of the wave function or of the wave function itself was equated quite dogmatically with probability and agreement with experience was subsequently verified. And so he was dissatisfied with the situation. Shortly thereafter though, or uh, in that same general kind of period, I'm conjecturing that Schrodinger uh, had a question of whether despite these equivalence results, wave mechanics could be extended farther than matrix mechanics could. And I'm conjecturing this for uh, a number of reasons. In particular, there were some letters between Schrodinger and uh, von Neumann, but also von Neumann and Weil around the same time that suggest Schrodinger really thought uh, that wave mechanics could be extended beyond matrix mechanics. It could um, provide, uh, in particular, a deterministic presentation of quantum mechanics. And so during this time, um, we had, um, turns out there was a debate between von Neumann and Schrodinger. And this debate is discussed uh, much later by Wigner in his 1970 paper discussing uh, Bell's theorem. And uh, for a variety of historical reasons that I can get into uh, in the discussion period, I think this must have taken place in 1927 or uh, at the latest uh, early 1928. But the gist of it was that von Neumann gave what he considered a qualitative argument against hidden variables in quantum mechanics. So he made a number of qualitative assumptions and argued hidden variables could not be accommodated. Schrodinger had some objections, but von Neumann replied to these. And uh, at least based on Wigner's reporting, Schrodinger seemed to have uh, ultimately accepted von Neumann's argument that hidden variables uh, could not be returned to 
quantum mechanics, where just a reminder, quantum mechanics is now being understood as what is uh, shared across matrix and wave mechanics. So it's something relatively specific. But obviously uh, some assumptions are being made uh, in making the claim that hidden variables cannot be returned. And so the question is, what are those or what were those uh, assumptions? And as I'm suggesting, uh, von Neumann was using the axiomatic method. And so he wanted this to be a formal question. He wanted the question of whether hidden variables could be quote unquote returned to quantum mechanics to be a um, question that is represented by the mathematics being used. But of course you need a unique characterization of the mathematics at the time. In addition, you also need um, to specify the qualitative assumptions that are being used in his um, qualitative proof against hidden variables. To briefly summarize, said there were two computational paths on offer, matrix and wave mechanics, and they appeared to be quite different on their face. In particular, matrix mechanics looked discrete and wave mechanics looked continuous in important respects. Then we had a number of uh, putative equivalence demonstrations. And coming out of this, we had um, matrix and wave mechanics and the operator formalisms all kind of collectively referred to as quantum mechanics. Hidden variables were ruled out based on an argument, a qualitative argument given by von Neumann around that same time. And the question is, uh, was it just a formal ruling out or an intuitive ruling out with respect to the formalisms on offer? And you want it to be formal. You wanted it to uh, be represented in the mathematics that's being used, at least if you're using the axiomatic method, that's the goal. But a unique characterization is necessary and you need to specify the qualitative assumptions that are going into uh, what counts as quantum mechanics. Now, moving to the third part of my talk, I'm going to talk about von Neumann's contributions. And I said at the outset that I'm going to claim that von Neumann's two 1927 papers successfully showed that hidden variables cannot exist in quantum mechanics, and that his book in 1932 just made this result explicit for his audience. And I'm going to remind us that we are now assuming that quantum mechanics means that stuff that coincides between matrix and wave mechanics. I'm then going to suggest that it was initially understood the, the question of hidden variables to be related to the development of new mathematics. Then going to cover von Neumann's two 1927 papers where he demonstrated uh, the Hilbert space equivalence of wave and matrix mechanics. Then discuss the qualitative assumptions that he thought went into quantum mechanics. Then I'm going to return to hidden variables and uh, his summary in the book. So to start, in early 1927, we had um, coming out of a series of lectures given by Hilbert, where some assistance was given by Nordheim and especially von Neumann to provide mathematical results. We had the development of an operator formalism by uh, that trio. And it assumed that all variables were continuous. This of course is strictly false. Um, the cases that mattered uh, physically were those where the variables uh, were discrete. And so they used a kind of trick to get it to um, get the system to behave the way that they wanted. In particular, they used uh, Dirac's or something like Dirac's delta function to pretend that the continuous variables that they were explicitly treating were in fact discrete. And the question that they ask at the end of that paper is, um, would a clarification of the domain of validity of Dirac's delta tell us something about the formal status of hidden variables in quantum mechanics? And just as a reminder, we're now assuming that quantum mechanics is the coincidence between matrix and wave mechanics. Von Neumann quite quickly answered uh, this in the negative. Um, and uh, he did so by demonstrating that these two computational paths, as I've called them, where he, von Neumann did some mopping up to make matrix mechanics and uh, wave mechanics look like fairly complete formalisms on their own. And then he demonstrated that each of these are an instance of an abstract Hilbert space when they're understood as uh, probabilistic theories. So this was the content of his uh, first 1927 paper 
And falling out from that, we see that trivially, insofar as they are each a representation of uh, an abstract Hilbert space, wave mechanics cannot be extended beyond matrix mechanics. It's just trivial. But as a consequence of this, the Dirac delta turns out to be irrelevant to the question of hidden variables. And so the uh, suggestion here by Hilbert, von Neumann, and Nordheim in their uh, joint paper that perhaps uh, fleshing out the math of the Dirac delta may give us a leg up on understanding hidden variables in the formalism uh, turned out to just not matter. Shortly after that, uh, was, uh, shortly after the Solvay conference, uh, von Neumann then considers what are the qualitative assumptions that go into quantum mechanics. And I'll remind everyone that he was fairly dissatisfied with just assuming the statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics. And so he says here, in the present work, such an inductive structure is to be attempted, where the inductive structure is just delineating those qualitative assumptions going into quantum mechanics. He continues, we make the assumption of the unconditional validity of ordinary probability theory. And it turns out that this, in combination with editorializing here, what, we th what he thinks were less far reaching factual and formal assumptions, turns out that this is sufficient for uh, the unambiguous derivation of quantum mechanics. And so uh, crudely put, the conclusion that he draws is probability theory plus general uncertainty relations and the uh, Heisenberg-Born understanding of those uncertainty relations, plus uh, implicitly assuming that the quantities we care about are those that are effectively measurable, suffices for the derivation of quantum mechanics. Uh, in particular, the Hilbert space uh, formulation of quantum mechanics. And so he says, this is the qualitative core of quantum mechanics. And uh, just recall that von Neumann around the same time gave a qualitative proof that he thought ruled out hidden variables. And uh, apparently Schrodinger accepted this proof as well. And so on qualitative grounds, quantum mechanics ruled out hidden variables. And I think he was making just those assumptions that he delineated in uh, this paper. And so quantum mechanics qualitatively rules out hidden variables. And then the question is, does the Hilbert space formulation uh, rule out hidden variables. And our expectation should be, if it's the correct apparatus, the expectation should be, yes, obviously the Hilbert space formalism rules out hidden variables. Why? Well, it was built precisely to represent all and only those important ingredients that go into quantum mechanics. Fairly trivial. So if it's the correct apparatus, it should rule out hidden variables. And I think this is what comes um, or becomes explicit in his uh, 1932 book. Um, and I'm going to say that I think he foreshadows this fact in the preface, um, but before I get to that, I just wanna note an important feature which um, uh, Adam uh, briefly mentioned um, in uh, his description of, of the situation, um, that von Neumann's book was actually uh, something of a textbook uh, summary for mathematicians at the time. Uh, so it uh, showed up in a series of books um, that was edited by Richard Courant, started in fact by Richard Courant, and it had a number of uh, mathematicians on the editorial board. And uh, the purpose was for summarizing the uh, major results of various areas of mathematics for a general uh, audience of uh, mathematical researchers. And I think this is something it's just missed uh, if you're focusing only on the English translation of the book, because the Princeton uh, translation just does not contain that prefatory information uh, about kind of the genesis of the book and its um, intended audience. Moving now to the preface, I think it foreshadows this understanding of the proof that I have laid out. And so there von Neumann says, uh, in the book, there will be a detailed discussion of the problem as to whether it's possible to trace the statistical character of quantum mechanics to an ambiguity in our description of nature. The explanation by hidden parameters has been proposed more than once and uh, me editorializing. Uh, I'd say this was proposed by Schrodinger in particular. However, it will appear that this can scarcely succeed in a satisfactory way. And I wanna emphasize what follows. Or more precisely, such an explanation is incompatible with certain qualitative fundamental postulates of quantum mechanics. 
And so he's emphasizing here that he is making some assumptions and those assumptions are the fundamental postulates of quantum mechanics. And obviously quantum mechanics, as he says it here, must be how quantum mechanics was understood at the time. After uh, about 295 pages of material, if you're looking at the English translation, uh, and so the first chapter where he discusses um, some of the history of the equivalence results between matrix and wave mechanics, as well as the transformation theory as it was developed by Dirac. Um, and in the second chapter lays out uh, the basics of the Hilbert space formalism. And then in the third discusses the uh, quantum statistics, he comes to a section that he labels the deductive development of the theory. There we see him um, after a couple introductory paragraphs, we see that he assumes probability theory. He assumes the Heisenberg-Born understanding of the uncertainty relations, and he assumes that the quantities we care about are those that are effectively measurable, which, uh, side note, these are just the qualitative assumptions that were present in his 1927 papers. After that, he presents a, a qualitative proof against hidden variables. That is, it's on fairly like physical intuitive grounds, uh, not involving substantial mathematical uh, uh, results. And this uh, proof actually uh, resembles in some important ways the proof that uh, Wigner recounts uh, in his 1970 paper that I say occurred in the 1927. And then he asks himself, or I say that what he's asking himself is, does the Hilbert space formalism bear this out? That is, does it also rule out hidden variables? In the second section of the fourth chapter then, he, he turns to the mathematical formalism. And so he starts out by assuming the Hilbert space formalism. He derives the statistical operator, uh, the representation of any uh, uh, physical system. And as a corollary of deriving the statistical operator, he shows that in fact, no, uh, hidden variables or states uh, that are uh, defined by uh, would-be hidden variables cannot exist in the Hilbert space formalism. And so what I'm saying here is this is a fairly trivial result. Um, it, it's not a hard result to derive and he's fairly upfront about assuming the qualitative assumptions and assuming the Hilbert space formalism that represents those qualitative assumptions. And so as I would say, this proof just demonstrates that the Hilbert space formalism was unique um, as a representation of quantum mechanics as it was understood at the time. And so it was just a trivial result that he made explicit in the book um, because his audience was not presumed to be intimately familiar with quantum mechanics at the time. And so this confirms our expectation or my expectation, um, which was that uh, the Hilbert space formalism should rule out hidden variables just because it was built to represent quantum mechanics as it was understood at the time, which we know um, von Neumann and others uh, seem to accept ruling out hidden variables. So to briefly summarize this third part, von Neumann introduced the mathematical core of quantum mechanics, which showed that matrix and wave mechanics co coincide in a fairly specific way, uh, each as a representation of uh, an abstract Hilbert space. He then characterized the basic qualitative assumptions of quantum mechanics. And then in his 1932 book, uh, he throws up this proof just to demonstrate that yes, um, quantum mechanics, or with respect to quantum mechanics, hidden variables were formally inconsistent. That is, they don't fit within the mathematical framework that he developed. And so quantum mechanics in that respect had attained its unique form or unique mathematical representation. To summarize what I've said in the talk so far, in the first section, I just discussed the axiomatic method and how uh, it works from a given interpretation to a unique formalism. And then with that, you can answer a variety of questions. I then said that there was a uniqueness question at the time that quantum mechanists were asking, namely whether quantum mechanics could be extended with hidden variables. And then I argued that von Neumann's two 1927 papers successfully answered this question in the negative and that his 1932 book just made these results explicit for his audience. 
So I now want to return to the question of uh, von Neumann's foolishness. And so the standard uh, understanding is that he was doing something uh, like what I've called an axiomatic reconsideration, which shows, uh, shows up in the diagram on the right, where what was he doing? He was trying to delineate the, uh, the essential features of any would-be quantum theory, and these must hold into the future. And he showed that from the assumptions that he made, uh, one can delineate a viable subset of interpretations and the hidden variable interpretations fall outside of that subset. But of course, the uh, foolishness criticism is he assumed linearity and we now know that that was not an essential feature of any would-be quantum theory. And what I've argued is we should rather understand him as performing an axiomatic completion whereby he starts with a, uh, an interpretation and a number of qualitative assumptions that were suggested by the uh, assumption of the equivalence of wave and matrix mechanics. He then developed a unique mathematical formalism that represented these qualitative assumptions. And then his proof merely demonstrated that the formalism was in agreement with the intuitive understanding of quantum mechanics insofar as it rules out hidden variables. So in conclusion, I just want to note a few uh, important consequences of this reframing. So first is the foolishness story just relies on an anachronistic framing. The axiomatic completion framing, as I've said, explicitly relies or explicitly assumes an interpretation and develops a formalism to represent that interpretation. And uh, perhaps there could be some return of a foolishness charge um, in saying that the axiomatic method is not an especially reliable one. And so von Neumann was foolish for using the axiomatic method. But just note that this is not the standard charge against von Neumann. The standard charge is he assumed linearity and that's foolish. Here, the charge would be he's using the axiomatic method and that's foolish. Second primary consequence, I think this makes it easier to understand how uh, von Neumann's work fits into what came later. And in particular, it shows that his 1927 works and its representation in the book later contribute fairly essentially to later research. Um, for instance, on, on the one hand, we have the, um, what I'm calling interpretive reconsiderations of Bohm and Bell. And we know Bohm in particular uh, was clued into what was going on in von Neumann's, um, von Neumann's work. And of course, we uh, heard from Adam um, about uh, Bell's work. But it also contributed fairly essentially to mathematical developments, developments which came from, of course, von Neumann himself, as well as Birkhoff, uh, um, uh, Cadison and Ringrose, of course, we're all familiar with that textbook, and uh, a plethora of mathematicians in between. My third. Uh, suggestion, which I think is a consequence of this reframing, uh, but of course it's going to be a little more contentious, is we not only shouldn't understand von Neumann as having not been foolish, I think this was a fairly humble reaction to the situation that folks faced in 1927. That is, it's fairly hard to say what's absolutely essential to any would-be quantum theory in 1927. In fact, the theory had only been developed about two years ago, over the course of the previous two years, I should say. And so von Neumann's approach was to instead start with the understanding that we have, which I've been calling an interpretation, and develop the mathematics that represents that understanding. And then when we learn more, when we've um, worked with these assumptions a little bit more, perhaps we'll reconsider what we are assuming, which is just what Bohm and uh, Bell and others did uh, starting in the uh, 1950s and onward. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. That was great. All right, so we have some time for questions. We'll take uh, about 10 minutes of questions, then we'll take a break, uh, and then we'll reconvene uh, at about uh, just, just after the hour, and then we'll have uh, an hour of general discussion on all of the talks. So as always, please uh, feel free to use the hand raising tool in the participants uh, uh, participants window to, uh, to ask a question, or, or you can use the chat window as well. Uh, I see um, 
a couple of hands, I think, from before. I think Lev and Guido had hands up, but those may be uh, older hands. Uh, for new hands, I see Alex. So Alex, why don't you go ahead and ask a question? Um, thanks, Chris. That was super interesting. Um, I have just um, a question that may have been addressed. I lost connection a bit in the middle, so apologies if, it ha if it's already been addressed. But um, could you maybe say more about within the axiomatic completion framing um, is like, could you describe how in that framing, the linearity assumption would kind of follow from the common understanding or existing interpretation that um, you have in mind, like with the, you know, on the left-hand side of your diagram? Yeah. So that's the kind of central question. And uh, uh, you didn't miss anything. Uh, I didn't say much about it. Um, part of the reason is I'm still trying to figure out just how um, it would have been understood historically. Um, so let me uh, flip back here uh, to uh, the assumptions as I was kind of characterizing them. So as I characterized it, von Neumann was assuming probability theory plus um, um, uh, Heisenberg and Born's understanding of the uncertainty relations. And uh, I think implicitly he was assuming that what we care about are uh, effectively measurable quantities. Um, given that characterization, it's a little difficult to see exactly where the linearity assumption comes in. However, it's fairly obvious that it's going to fall out. Um, and so you could either place it in uh, probability theory, whereby um, it's just fairly commonly accepted that um, statistical quantities behave such that their expectation values um, behave linearly. Um, so I think that would have been fairly common at the time for um, any statistical theory. But you can also see that if you're assuming the, the Heisenberg-Born understanding of the uncertainty relations, as well as assuming that all you care about are quantities that can actually be measured, um, it's fairly easy to see there too that uh, the only quantities that are going to be viable are those that are already represented in uh, uh, the Hilbert space formalism, um, which you're assuming linearity um, therein. Um, so I think I'm still trying to figure out exactly where von Neumann would place the linearity assumption in there. I, I'm inclined to think it he would place it under probability theory, um, but I'm still working on figuring that out. Unfortunately, we've lost a lot of uh, records of von Neumann's um, while he was still uh, in Europe. See, thank you. So uh, I think maybe uh, Adam, did you have a question also? I think maybe you you, you put a chat message in, uh, in the chat window for me. No, I'm I'm good for now. I'll have okay. a question later. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Um, so next, I have uh, uh, Stephen French, and then Simon, you'll be next. Oh, hey, um, uh, thanks, Chris. That was a great talk. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about um, von Neumann's um, dissatisfaction with the Hilbert space formalism, which, um, and the move to the type two algebra. So I think Miklos Rede um, wrote about this and said that even at the time of writing the 1932 book, he was becoming dissatisfied with that. Do you, I mean, would you say that's just a sort of a further example or further exemplifies his humble approach? Or, I mean, how, how would you locate that within your narrative? That's a great question. And that's something that I, I um, want to turn to now. Um, I sort of put that aside to try to figure out what's going on in that 1927 stuff. Um, I think that's the way that I would incorporate it. So I think, um, I haven't looked at Miklos's work in a while, but um, I recall being um, uh, strongly agreeing with, with what he said there. And I think, yes, that that should fit into this kind of humility, or at least as I'm painting it, humility, um, in that what he's looking for now um, is an algebraic framework that is easier to kind of pull some assumptions out, put some new assumptions back in, um, just easier to work with in general, and perhaps moving to say an atomless uh, type two one um, representation might give us um, back um, some interpretive options. So I think that's that's the direction I would go. Yeah. Uh, 
Great. Um, Simon? Um, <clears throat> Chris, great talk. I enjoyed it. Um, I just wonder, well, one comment, um, you missed out Everett. And um, after all, von Neumann's book was hugely influential on Everett as well. Um, uh, but relatedly, I suppose, um, might you characterize von Neumann's uh, argument or, or the structure of uh, his argument that uh, if there were any hidden variables, then they must be epiphenomenal with respect to the statistical predictions of quantum mechanics? In, in which case, it's not so obvious that Berman mechanics is a good counterexample. Yeah, that's in fact how I, I uh, tend to think of it. Um, so um, I, I characterize it in a number of ways. This is, I think, the uh, the least, what I've presented so far is the least contentious way to present what's going on. But I think uh, von Neumann still would have been fairly happy to say, look, um, all I care about are those variables that, um, that we can actually measure. Um, and of course, uh, in that respect, uh, Bohmian mechanics is just not going to count as a, a counterexample. Um, though, of course, perhaps um, if you could convince him that the uncertainty relations may be violated in cert certain situations, then you know maybe uh, maybe there is a significant difference there. But um, I think he's going to be perfectly fine uh, accepting uh, that kind of epiphenomenal uh, characterization of Bohmian mechanics and saying, "Look, it's just not it's not a counterexample to what I've given." And, but whereas Valentini's non-equilibrium version of Bohmian mechanics would be correct. Right. Yeah, that's my understanding at least. Or, or maybe just another theory entirely. I mean, I, I don't know. How does that go? Yeah, so, I mean, I think he would count that as, so uh, trying to remember the exact phrasing, um, von Neumann says um, the, uh, fundamental assumption, quantum mechanics would have to be objectively false. And I think on Valentini's presentation, uh, quantum mechanics is false. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Great, uh, Klaus? Yes, so Chris, thanks for your talk. Uh, in support of your view, I would like to mention, I think the main point of von Neumann's proof is that his abstract expectation values, which took to be linear as they are in classical and quantum mechanics, are given by tracing with a density operator. And that's, I think, what he meant by the conclusion of quantum mechanics. That's why he could think that there are no hidden variables, because <laughs> the density operators are canonical in formalism. And yeah. this is such a question. Uh, I think, and uh, I very much like this talk. But, but so I think that's the background to his linearity assumption. He solved the whole thing in terms of expectation values. He even writes X, at least in the English translation. So Thank you. Great. Um, so I see a couple of uh, hands still raised. Uh, Simon, I think if your question is 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 all set, um, Klaus, you asked your question. Uh, Guido and Lev, do you, do you have questions also, or are those hands raised from last time? Well, um, uh, they are from last time, but they also relate to what Chris said. So I could could start now, or I can wait. Or I can wait. Um, okay, well, in, in that case, well, uh, Chris, uh, I really, really liked your talk, uh, and uh, I think I agree with, with everything. I mean, the only things, uh, uh, I mean, there, there were some things I didn't know, and, you know, I need to, need to absorb, uh, but, uh, you know, everything that, uh, that, that's, uh, uh, you know, I'm uh, sort of familiar with, uh, can, could recognize, I, I completely agree, and I, I hope you've got stuff written up, uh, and I'm particularly interested in, uh, 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 in hearing about the, the, the Schrodinger von Neumann connection. Um, but uh, um, so uh, um, I think, uh, yes, I mean, what, uh, what, what, what you talked about uh, uh, sort of, uh, is, very, is very, very relevant to uh, also what uh, Adam was, uh, was, was saying earlier. Uh, I mean, the, the question, what von Neumann thought himself about his results and uh, how the interpretation of this result as you know, ruling out hidden variables uh, in the uh, you know in the sense that we are familiar with uh, you know came came about um, and uh, um, 
yeah, so um, and I think that 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 quote about uh, you know quantum mechanics having to be objectively false, uh, you know, that's uh, that's very ambiguous. Uh, yeah, you know, if if you really look at the fine print uh, as spelled out by you, uh, you know what what von Neumann is saying is uh, we've got. Uh, we've got a theory which has a certain algebraic structure, and uh, you know, here I'm showing what the statistical states are that go along with that algebraic structure. And uh, uh, well, if we were to introduce uh, uh, you know, statistical states that are dispersion free, uh, that would mean that the algebraic structure that we started with was wrong, uh, which is obviously true. You know, if we add, you know, further, uh, you know, physical quantities, uh, you know, uh, the algebraic structure of quantum operators is no longer the algebraic structure of the physical quantities. Um, so, um, you know, I think yeah, that's what that quote means. And yeah, it doesn't mean what uh, we think it means. Um, I think actually, you know, the, the person who started, you know, the, 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 the folklore about, about von Neumann's theorem was Max Born. And, uh, um, and in fact, you know, he started that very early, you know, that was soon after the, uh, the uh, 1927 paper. Uh, in fact, Max Born was the one who uh, you know, presented the paper at the um, Göttingen Academy of Sciences. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a little known paper by Born, I think it's from 1929, in which uh, uh, you know, he has this, you know, it's the first time uh, that I know of where he's got the statement about, uh, well, you know, if the uh, if the determinists, uh, you know, want to complain, uh, you know, you know, then uh, you know they have to, they have, they, they, you know, they have to show that quantum mechanics is objectively false, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, so um, I suspect that uh, you know Born, uh, you know, showed us a lot of, uh, of of responsibility in sort of transforming von Neumann's uh, uh, <coughs> theorem in uh, you know what uh, uh, what it what it became in the in the in, in the folklore. Um, as to von Neumann himself, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know of many other places where he comments on that. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, there's uh, uh, there are some discussion comments uh, uh, at the I think it was uh, uh, the Warsaw Conference in 1939. You know, after I think after talk by Bohr. You know, there are, uh, there are some discussion comments by von Neumann and uh, um, yeah, there, um, uh, well, you know, maybe, maybe he's just being brief or something, but that sounds pretty brutal. I know that that really sounds as if he's saying, you know, hidden variables are, are out, but uh, you know, that's the, that's the only place uh, that I that I know of, uh, where you know maybe for Neumann, uh, um, uh, yeah, where me, for Neumann sounds as if he he believes, uh, you know, that for Neumann's theorem, uh, you know, rules out hidden uh, hidden variables. Um, and uh, just yeah, uh, one one last thing, and then maybe the other things I wanted to say, and I'll I'll say after after the break, uh, the, the, you know, less less connected with with your talk uh, um uh this um in in, in, that, in that red volume that uh, that uh, that elise showed uh you know there's some um, nice correspondence between uh, yeah there it is uh, uh between hermann and max jammer in the 60s when max jammer was uh, was writing his uh, you know one one of his big one of his big books and uh, yeah uh Yammer is uh, um, uh, querying Hermann's criticism of, of von Neumann, uh, 
saying, uh, no, I don't think, uh, yeah, uh, I don't think von Neumann meant it like this, and so on and so forth. And uh, um, and Hermann herself, uh, you know, then comments, uh, well, um, yeah, no, maybe, uh, you know, uh, maybe I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't interpreting von Neumann in that way. You know, if you read him, uh, you know, in in this other way, and she she suggests some textual evidence, uh, you know, that maybe he didn't. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, his theorem to to, to rule out hidden variables. Uh, you know. um, uh, so that's 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 also very interesting to uh, to read. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware of that. So uh, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, that seems to fit nicely with the, what I'm suggesting here. Um, so uh, I will uh, definitely have to check that out. And I actually wasn't aware of the. The, the Born paper. Um, I have some other thoughts on, yeah. on uh, of course, how the um, uh, misunderstanding of von Neumann arose, but... Um, yes, you know, we, uh, we were alerted to that Born paper because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's in one of the epigraphs uh, of, uh, of Hermann's uh, 1933 manuscript. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Um,